Welcome to another edition of Cover to Cover and um, I have two amazing guests in this edition which I cannot wait to get stuck into. We have a book by Hassan Tabada who is a journalist in this country that have had many positions in broadcasting as well as in print and he has written this book Hack with a Grenade. I think a book that really should do better than it has done thus far and by the time you've listened to my interview with him I'm sure you will agree. The second book is a very different book. We very often don't think about the status of animals other than ourselves in this country. I had the pleasure of also interviewing Helena Creel about Meditating with Rhinos, her second book, which is absolutely beautifully written. But we kick off this edition by having a look at a conversation I have recorded with Hassan Tabada about this beautiful book of his experiences as a newspaper man. Hassan, thank you so much for being in conversation with me uh, here on Cover to Cover, and congratulations on what was really an absolutely fantastic read. I appreciate that, and, and high praise coming from you, Eusebius. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of your work, so that, that means You've a lot. always been generous since I met you, and um, I really appreciate that. <laughs> but I'm being just sincere. I am brutally honest with book reviews. And if I had to describe this book, let's both describe it. For me, I would say, Hassan, I'm not sure what you set out to achieve in terms of intention, but someone might pick up this book and think this is probably a book for journalists and aspiring journalists. I would disagree with them. This is a book written by a seasoned journalist about stories on his beat as a journalist and as an editor. But each chapter, as I said to my co-host Joanne Joseph, is so beautifully observed in terms of the people that Hassan has written about that actually each of the chapters becomes social and political commentary about Cape Town and ultimately about South Africa. And in that sense, it's a book for any person who is engaged on questions of identity, race, marginalization, apartheid, spatial planning, uh, misogyny within the world of business and sport. It is thematically very wide ranging, even though the golden thread is journalism. Hassan? What did you set out to achieve? Is that a decent summary of the intention behind the book? I think that's spot on, Eusebius. So journalism is used as that thread, as that device to tell a story about South Africa, really. And um, it's very personal to me because a lot of these stories, I, immerse, I have to immerse myself into these stories and the characters that I use to tell a South African story. So, I mean, I tackle things about identity and my own identity Mm -hmm. as a colored uh, a man working in the media space and some of the challenges there, but also the kind of conversations we're having about identity in South Africa, you know, and race identity. But then there's also these things that are creeping into everyday life, like gentrification. The issue about missing children, for example, and crime and how we mm -hmm. treat that, you know, we kind of shorthand over these things. And through the characters, that I had met over the years. Now, very importantly also, if I had to be the type of editor that sat in an office waiting for things to happen, I wouldn't have been able to write this book. So the book is also about journalism, about yes. groundbreaking journalism Absolutely. and about doing things differently, you know, and yes. innovative, innovating in the space. Well, let's give some examples of a couple of the chapters. You must go out and buy this book. I recommend it highly, Heck with a Grenade. You can find it at bookstores across the country. Um, chapter two, Danny and the Invisible People. One of the most heartwarming stories that Hassan tells is not just an issue of race, but also an issue of class, how we render certain people invisible. If you are watching this interview online, chances are you are not a homeless person. And that is why the story of Danny Hassan is so, so important. In a nutshell, what is chapter two about? Okay, so chapter two, I had a, from, from the outset of, of meeting Danny, this homeless guy who really um, was brought to life a, a, what could have been a very mundane series on homeless people in a daily newspaper. You know, it's the kind of content that people roll their eyes at because what content on homeless people are you going to do that hasn't been done before? But with Danny being able to write and tell his lived experience, we brought the issue of homelessness to life in a daily newspaper for at least three weeks and then three years after that until he passed away, unfortunately, early last year. But my ulterior motive is how can we have 
how can we do sincere storytelling in a newsroom where we still have prejudices about race, about homo, uh, homosexuality, about HIV AIDS? And, and Danny was all of that. You know, he was a homeless guy, he was white, he was gay, and he was HIV positive. So I wanted to put him next to the reporters mm. so that, that, that they could start stripping away their own prejudices. And they had to, he because also he came was into the newsroom. Right? He was interesting, he had dreams, he had a life narrative, he was literate, he could write, so much so that you put him on the front page, in fact, I don't know if anyone can see that clearly, maybe not with um, the thing that I have here, so I'll read it out to you, the front page of the Cape Argus on the 11th of April in 2016, and that was a quote, an excerpt from him in the first person, which I think was also fantastic, because then you get his subjectivity across, and it says, I'm just like you, but I'm homeless. If you pick up the Cape Argus on that day, Chassant, you can't again, at least not without taking responsibility for, for your lack of empathy, you could never again be indifferent towards a homeless person on the promenade or at the next robot. No, exactly. And, and the thing is, I, I like what you say there about Danny being more than the sum of his parts or his circumstances that brought him to where he was in that, in, that, in that time. And he's a reminder to all of us that we're one paycheck away from being homeless. I mean, that's the reality for most South Africans, you know? Yeah. And the thing with Danny is, he's got a worldview. He came to sit in our conferences and the contributions he made through his eyes were very telling. He was very well read. He understood what was going on in the world and in society. But at the same time, he didn't take anything for granted. So I would walk around the newsroom and there Danny be, would be, doing an online journalism course, you know, trying to improve himself. So the kind of things we, the home in inverted commas, take for granted, yeah. you know, and here's a homeless man grabbing every opportunity he poss possibly could. Yeah. Let's take a completely different chapter and give people another taste of the book and how journalism allows you to observe society and not just to archive what is happening, but also to really, really do some substantive social and political commentary. You make a remarkable claim on page 85, and it goes as follows. Five years on, I look back at that student co-edited edition of Cape Argus and hold it up as my finest moment as a newspaper editor and perhaps my entire career in journalism. Now, you started your journalism career at the age of 19 when you're doing an internship. So for you to make that claim uh, in your early 40s, late 30s is a gigantic claim to make. We've spoken about homeless people. There's another ill in society the world over, and it's ageism. Old people think they can learn little from young people, and very often young people think old people gifted us an imperfect world, they must shut up. What is it about the fees must fall moment that was so, so fascinating for you as an editor when you responded to a challenge from Gus Silber? So um, on that age note, I'll settle for late 30s, Eusebius, if you don't mind at all. <laughs> but um, to be honest with you, it all happened by accident. And again, Gus Solber was that kind of catalyst to our consciousness on social media. And he said, is there any editor out there who will take up the challenge to allow students to run the newspaper for the day? I forget the exact wording, but without thinking, I took up the challenge. And then I found myself in real trouble because where were we going to find the students in a, on a practical level to bring out an edition in, an, in the next couple of hours for the following day? And then that became a backstory in its own right, how we found those students. But more than that, mm -hmm. um, I think they took me by surprise. You know, I remember saying on the day that this wasn't your mommy's Cape Argus because the students were obviously complaining that the traditional news media um, was not giving them the voice that they would to the minister and the universities and the vice chancellors. All the players except the student voice was coming through with a few notable exceptions like Daily Vox, Khadija, Patel's um, outfit did amazing work at the time, you know. So um, here was an opportunity for the students to have their own space where they chose their own headlines, captions, images, and their own stories, their own diaries. And I, I, I was kind of at their mercy as well because I am accountable for that newspaper. If they say something that's defamatory, I'm the guy that's going to get sued. But it was, it was a leap of faith. 
in order to win their trust, I had to do something bold, you know, and it paid off. It was a gamble, uh, make no mistake about it. Um, and because I had committed very publicly to give the space. But what I learned from these students was they, contrary to popular belief, they're not lazy. They are actually critical thinkers. They're not apathetic, but they are very important to activism and to the national discourse in this country, you know, and they showed us. Yeah. They showed us how they started very peacefully. With you, Hassan, which is also important because very often the lazy critics of the students were on some, these are the kind of students who probably just want an easy pass on their careers and also discount yep. on marks, et cetera, et cetera. Many of them went on to get cum laude degrees in areas like, for example, theater, and many of them are flourishing post-university and trying to take that fight further in the corporate world as well. So also the assumption that it must be the weaker, academically weaker students that are busy with a toy toy on UCT campus, that proved to not be the case. I mean, your, your chief sub-editor, uh, you, you know, was chuffed at the clean copy that was uh, given ahead of time. So it was also interesting how you had to intellectually, collectively humble yourselves uh, to the brain power of the students rather than seeing them just as an amorphous, anti-intellectual, lazy bunch. Yeah, no, they took me completely by surprise without me sounding patronizing. I didn't expect the kind of skill that they were bringing to the table. It was immense. It was it was leadership in action, you know? And, you know, there's always this idea or, or it's a truism that you can't um, edit a newspaper by democracy. But in this instance, the, sh the students proved that, that whole notion wrong, you know? And for, maybe it was a fluke, but in one instance, Absolutely. there is a case where there was a democratic editing of a newspaper. And you mentioned students involved, so Amir Conrad, he um, graduated cum laude in in um, drama That's in right. in BA um, in BA and she's she drama as a major and she went on to co-direct and write and in the fall which was an acclaimed um, um, theater production on the Fismas Fall movement that ran at the Baxter Theater and other places all over the world as well so and and then Brian Kamanga is also one of the student yeah, leaders that was involved right. in is a very smart guy, you know. Um, I don't know if you follow him on social media. He is next level, you know, leadership. Lastly, just in the two minutes we have left, just to give them a final taste and we'll bring it back to journalism. Ramona thought she had found Jesus in the toilet. That's a lacquer first chapter because it is a compelling story to tell. But beyond that, very often middle-class South Africans, black and white, and other colors in between, are very condescending when it comes to the way we respond to mass media that focuses on the poorest of the poor. So we are intrigued by the success of the Daily Sun or on television of Moja Love as a TV channel. But very briefly, what is it about tabloidization that on the one hand can be bad for journalism, but on the other hand, when you think about your time at Daily Voice, there is some critically important lessons to be learned from mainstream media from where tabloids fit into the lives of poor people. So it's very important, the ordering of the chapters, and they're very deliberate as well, because it also talks about my journey, you know, going from the Daily Voice into the more serious newspapers as I graduated, you know, became an, an older guy, I suppose, with a receding airline. But the idea is that, um, you know, tabloid journalists, journalism really get to the bread and butter issues. And we often take these things for granted, but that's the real politics that affect people. It's not identity politics when Julius Malema says something crazy or the president says something. That's not necessarily politics for ordinary South Africans. If somebody's dumping um, on a football field in an area like Lavender Hill on the Cape Flats, mm -hmm. that's the politics that affects ordinary South Africans. And that's where 
the uh, tabloid journalism, uh, journal, uh, journalism and, and tabloid newspapers and, and platforms do so well. Um, they're able to campaign, they're able to do advocacy journalism that go, go to the heart of the, the fabric of our, of our communities, you know. And, and it's the kind of things that um, the traditional newspapers often gloss over, you know. They don't pay attention to the, to the real issues that affect people. And we kind of live up here, or we report here, yeah. when the real issues are really very much down here, you know? And that's, that's the important gap. And I almost want to say that I want to challenge the fact that the tabloids are actually the mainstream and it's the mainstream papers that are, mm. are actually on the fringes, you know? Absolutely, beautifully put. I want another opportunity for us to have a longer conversation, maybe with a live audience, because I think this book deserves that. And there's so much more to tease out in chapters I had not mentioned, but in the meantime, I would strongly encourage you to buy a copy of Hack with a Grenade. And that is by Hassan Tabada, really, really, really delightful lead. Hassan, congratulations and thanks so much for being part of the conversations today. Thanks, Eusebius. Thank you so much to Hassan for recounting stories from journalism that illuminate social and political issues in our country.